In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I want to first thank Abuna Muros and Abuna, Meritius, Abuna Mark, Abuna Corollos, and Abuna Mina, and all the fathers of the church, and all of you for having me today on this blessed fast of St. Mary. And of course, we speak, I know I'm very happy with the topic, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and today we're going to speak about gentleness. And I'm going to rely heavily, uh, heavily on the verses from the Bible and the Church Fathers. I love the Church Fathers and, of course, the verses that we have in our Bible. But I want to start off with something on the, word, on the idea of gentleness. The Lord teaches us gentleness He says in Isaiah, what is gentleness? Hmm. In Isaiah 42, 4, 3, okay? Chapter 42, verse 3. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. Do you know what a bruised reed is? Hmm. You see this flower? It's on a reed, right? And then he says a, a bruised reed. So a bruised reed is like this. It's bruised. You know what the Lord will do with this reed? He won't break it. Others will see it walk, when people walk by. They'll see it and they'll break it off. The Lord will, eh, he's so gentle. He'll take it and he puts it back together and he'll tie it up with a string. A bruised reed he will not break. He's so gentle. Our Lord is very gentle. A smoking flax. You ever seen a, when you go on a retreat, especially we have the fireplaces, usually in most retreat places that we go to. There's a fireplace, or there's a, sorry, there's a, a fire outside. At the very end, you see the embers still burning a little bit, but the fire is almost out. Some will eh, take water and just throw it on there. The Lord won't put it out. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He's so gentle. Our Lord is very gentle. And this is one of the fruit of the Spirit. As Abuna, I think some days ago, spoke about a diamond having many facets, and every, the, the, the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, this is one facet of it, which is gentleness. So, we, where do we see this? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 23, but the fruit of the Spirit, as, as I'm sure you've heard already many times, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Against such there is no law. So, gentleness, if we were to define what gentleness is, it is a fruit of the Spirit, a virtue of meekness of personality, mildness and discretion, softness of manner. Softness. Softness of manner. Being amiable or pleasant among friends. Mish harsh. Nowadays we go on retreats and we want to do pranks to each other. Harsh. One retreat I went on, and some kid put on another kid's pillow at night, sardine, open can of sardine. Harshness, it's no gentleness at all. Where's the gentleness? Being amiable, being pleasant among friends. Insensitivity, you've got hasas. Sensitivity to the needs of others. Sensitivity to the needs of others. This is what gentleness is. This is what gentleness is. Hmm. We find gentleness even in the speech. Imagine this, that Moses is being spoken against. In Numbers chapter 12, we find Moses is spoken against because he had married an Ethiopian woman. And who speaks against him? Who starts gossiping about him? Mariam, and who else? Aaron. Does God really speak to him? Does he not also speak to us? Is he the only one that's a prophet? And the Lord heard it. And he was very angry. 
and he brought all three to him, to the tabernacle of meeting. And he told Miriam and Aaron to come forward. And imagine hearing from God himself all that went on behind Moses' back. So Moses is sitting there listening to what he, God is saying to Aaron and to Miriam about all that had happened. And we, write, we read that now the man Moses was very humble. More than all men who were on the face of the earth. More than all men on the face of a, the earth. I have never heard a verse, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that this has been said about anyone else. More humble than anyone on the face of the earth. And God punished Miriam with leprosy. And, of course, the people of Israel could not move to Paran until she had been cured from her leprosy. When she was struck with leprosy by God, you find that Moses was asked by Aaron. Aaron asks Moses, please, don't let her be like one that's half dead. Anybody else in this situation could have said, eh, she was speaking behind my back like you were to stay here. Right? She deserves it. Not Moses. Not Moses. What does he do? So Moses, he didn't just pray. He cried out to the Lord saying, please heal her, O Lord, O God, I pray. Please heal her, O God, I pray. Heal her. Heal her. He's so gentle in his words and his speech and his prayer. He was forgiving in this way. So we find in his manner of life and in his speech and in his prayer, he was very gentle, even after having heard all this going on in, his, in the background. It reminds us of the verse in Proverbs, chapter 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath. A soft answer. Sometimes we want to give, as we as you said earlier, and we're so proud of ourselves. And then when we speak about to others about what we did, how shameful. This is not a Christian way. This is not a way of gentleness. A soft answer turns away wrath. By this way, and when people take what's rightfully theirs and don't allow them, don't allow themselves to be in long suffering, we can stir up more wrath in people. We can stir up, and, and they don't forget. Pope Shiruda once said very beautifully, he says, if there is something that's in your heart, do not allow it to, to reach your tongue. Because once you say it, how can you now take it back from those who heard it? Good luck. You can't take it back. It's hard. It's hard to make up what people heard. So while it's still in your heart, work on it. Work on it. Work on being soft in your answers, forgiving, excusing others for their faults. A soft answer turns away wrath. A soft answer. You want to be gentle? You want to have the fruit of the Spirit? Have a soft answer that turns away wrath, and you will be gentle towards people. St. Ephraim the Syrian writes, Our Lord gave most of his assistance with persuasion rather than with admonition. He didn't rebuke people. You have to follow me. Now. Did he say this? Hollis. Never. He never said this. He said, he, by persuasion, gentle showers soften the earth and thoroughly penetrate it. But a beating rain, you know when the rain is hitting hard, when it's raining hard? Beating rain hardens and compresses the surface of the earth so that it will not be absorbed. The plants will not absorb it because it, the rain came down hard and beat it. 
A harsh statement evokes anger. Sometimes somebody says one word, as St. James writes in chapter 3 of the epistle, he says, with it, look how uh, a small fire, a large forest kindles. Or is kindled, uh, a, lar a forest is kindled by a small, small fire. And the tongue is a world of iniquity. A tongue is a world of iniquity. A harsh statement evokes anger, and with it comes injury. Try it, and when you get a cut, even if it's deep, some stitches, 10 days later, it's healed. But a harsh word can stick with people forever. A harsh word. How many people have I heard, you know, in 1989, he said this to me. 89, what are you talking about? This is like 30 years ago. It sticks, it hurts, it can still wound others. Many times I heard things from, such a, from the past, from married couples who have been married for 40 years. Of course we ought to forgive, this needs more work. Or people who have had friends for 30 years. Don't allow words to cause injury to others. A harsh statement invokes anger and with it comes injury. Whenever a harsh word opens a door, anger enters in. And on the heels of anger, injury. So when you say something harsh, you open the door to anger, and when anger enters, injury. It destroys emotions, feelings. It ruins relationships. Be gentle. If you have an argument, use persuasion, not harsh words. Make it about the subject, not about the person. Someone may say, when you look at an issue that they're having an argument, they'll say, are you unintelligent? Of course, I'm saying it very nicely, gently. I wish that they would say the word, are you unintelligent? They say worse things than this. So it no longer becomes about the subject, it becomes about the character, the intelligence of the person. Where's the gentleness? Can we stick on topic? Let's solve the issue. Let's not speak about the person. Whenever a harsh word opens a door, a door, anger enters in, and on the heels of anger, injury. To have a gentle spirit, St. Augustine writes, this is the wisdom which tames the tongue, descending from above, not springing from the human heart. So this word this has come from, comes from above, and it tames the tongue. Gentleness comes from who? God, comes from above and it tames the tongue. Hmm. So wisdom is from above. In James chapter 3, verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. When you have wisdom from above, it is pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. When you ask God of wisdom, this is how you can attain gentleness, you ask of God for wisdom. With wisdom comes these three things. Pure, it's pure, and peaceable, and gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, or five things, I miscounted. So ask for wisdom, and you will have gentleness. The Lord says about gentleness, in Matthew chapter 11, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why should I learn from you, Lord? Why should I learn from you? Because for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is a light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you know what a yoke is? It's not the inside of an egg, as I usually get. If you ever see a farm in which they are using uh, old tools to till the ground and to put tro uh, a trough in the ground, they have maybe two oxen 
and they're tied together with a big piece of wood and in between them, so one's tied here, one's tied here, and in between them, there is like a plow that plows the ground. That thing that's tied around the, two, the necks of the two ox is called a yoke. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm gentle. I'm gentle. So when you, how, does this, how is this practically done? How do we see this being practically played out? Sometimes the world, we find tribulation. As the Lord said, in the world you shall have tribulation. It has many tribulations. Drugs, lust, work, persecution, all kinds of things. But if we rely on God, when we sin, when we fall into various sins, what does the Lord say? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. We go to confession. We repent. I don't know really of any priest who took a cross and hit the kid over the head. Boom. Have you ever heard this happen? Huh? No. Abuna is the image of Christ. Image of Christ. And this is why we call him Abuna. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about the fathers here. I'm still working on it. <laughs> but an image of Christ in gentleness when it comes to confession, to repentance. Quickly he forgives, but we need to go to him. Take this yoke upon you. If you're ashamed of whatever it is that you have done in life, come to me. Come to me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So learn from Him. We ought to learn from Christ. How do I obtain gentleness? We have to found gentleness on humility. Humility. St. Augustine, I know this is long, if you could read it. He says, you are to take my yoke upon you and learn from me. You are not learning from me how to refashion the fabric of the world, nor to create all things visible and invisible, nor to work miracles and raise the dead. Rather, you are simply learning of me, that I am meek and lowly in a heart. The Lord is not asking you to do, be like me and create the world and do these things. No, no, no. What should I learn from the Lord? I should learn from Him. I should take from Him that He is meek and lowly in heart. And then He continues to say, if you wish to, if you, if you wish to reach a high place, or you to reach high, then begin at the lowest level. If you want to reach high, begin where? Low. If you are trying to construct some mighty edifice, a tower, a building, what do you do for those who are in engineering and construction? If I want to build a very high building, a very large tower, what do I have to do first? Huh? I have to dig. I have to dig deep. As high as a tower, sometimes much more, I have to dig the foundation. I have to go low. So this is what St. Augustine is saying. He says, if you are trying to construct some mighty edifice in height, you will begin with the lowest foundation. This is humility. However great the mass of the building you may wish to design or erect, the taller the building is to be, the deeper you will dig the foundation. The building in the course of its erection rises up high, but he who digs its foundation must first go down very low. So then you see even a building is low before it is high, and the tower is raised only after humiliation or after humility. You want to be great in the eyes of God? Go low. Be gentle. Have the fruit of the Spirit of which the facet of gentleness is on. Go low. Have humility. Humility. Humility, sometimes, as a side note, sometimes we confuse humility and modesty. So modesty or pride, right? When you are, not, not modesty, but pride, 
uh, sometimes people are prideful in uh, exaggerating who they are. Do you know what I mean? Right? Do you know what I finished? Do you know what I work? Do you know what I do? Do you know who I am? That's pride. Modesty is uh, not presenting or not having the things that are for show, but being uh, very um, balanced in how you dress, right? How you speak, all these things. Humility is none of these things. Humility is you know who you are before God. You know who you are before God. So yes, I may, I may have the nicest car outside, the nicest house. This is not humility. This is not the idea of humility. That's okay. That doesn't mean you're not humble. You can be very rich and very humble at the same time. You can be very rich and eh, very humble. As a matter of fact, St. Anthony the Great, St. Anthony the Great, he had 300 acres of land. And he's probably, I mean, during that time, you were probably the richest person on the face of the earth. Because land meant wealth. And yet, he didn't forget his God. He wasn't, he was not not humble. He heard a word from God in the church. If you want to be my disciple and follow me, sell all that you have, take up your cross and follow me, and give to the poor and follow me. And it touched his heart and he went after God. So if you want to have gentleness with others, be humble. It's, it's, it's the foundation in which other things can be built. It's bearing with one another. Bearing with one another. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 2. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. In love. If you have love, you have gentleness. Right? So it's bearing with one another. This is what gentleness is. St. John Chrysostom writes, How is it possible to walk worthily with all lowliness? Meekness is the foundation of all virtue. If you are humble and are aware of your limits, that's the idea of humility again, you are aware of your limits and remember how you were saved, you will take this re re recollection as the motive for every excellent moral behavior. You will not be excessively impressed with either chains or privileges. You will remember that all is of grace and so walk humbly with all lowliness. He says not in words only or even in deeds, but more so in the very manner and tone of your eh, voice. And the tone and the manner of your voice shows a eh, humility. And it's actually a facet of the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, being gentle. In the, in the very manner and tone of... So it's not enough to work with words and deeds, but even the tone of voice. Now, Mokhin had somebody can... Uh, you, as parents, you could tell your kid to do something. The response could be, a eh, Hadr. Or it could be, Hadr. Same word. Very different tone. Yes? Be gentle in your tone. Be gentle in your tone. It's not just mere words. It's not just your, your, your deeds, but your tone and your voice. And not meek toward one person and rude toward another, but humble toward everyone, whether enemy or friend, great or small. Great or small. Now, for instance, sometimes a little child will come and talk to me. I give him, a child, my undivided attention. Even though he's small. Even if a doctor wants to talk to me, but I'm talking to the, I have to give him his time. I don't lessen from who he is by not giving him his time. I give him attention. And this is humility. You give attention to everyone and you are not meek towards one and rude towards another, but humble toward everyone, whether enemy or friend, great or small. This is us having gentleness.
knowing, hum having humility. You, in, in order to attain gentleness, you have to have a maturity in your spiritual life. Maturity in spirit. St. Jerome writes, anyone who understands what is bearing one another in love, what does this mean, bearing one, one another in love? Will understand that this is a precept appropriate to the faithful. It is not indeed saints who have any need to bear one another. Rather, it is those in the earlier stages of Christian life. The earlier stages of Christian life. If you're mature in your Christian life, you hear the word bear with another, you're like, oh, I did that. It's easy. But those who are beginning, bear with another, yes, now I have to begin to practice. Like any type of spiritual thing that you do in your life, when you or anything that you do in your physical life. I want to ride a bike. I want to work out. I want to gain 10 pounds of muscle. I want to uh, slim 10 pounds of weight. Whatever it may be. What do you do? In the beginning, you work hard. And you have to push. And you have to have push down your, your unwillingness and turn it into your will. I don't want to get up early. So you spite yourself. Oh, I don't want to get up? I'm going to get up and do it. Right? But 10 years in working out, tell a person to get up and to do, very easy. Why? Because he's had so much time doing it. It's become a habit. In the spiritual life, to tell somebody, bear with one another, maybe in the beginning of their spiritual life, they have to work on it. But those who are mature, ah, it's easy. I've been doing this for 30 years, 20 years, 15 years, two years even. It's easy when you are practicing, but you have to practice at it. So he says, rather it is those in the earlier stages of Christian life who being human are still under the control of some passion. Nor is it strange that this should be said to the Ephesians. Among them, there were surely some who still had to bear patiently with others. So begin to practice it so that you can have maturity in your spiritual life when it comes to gentleness. Begin practicing it. Practicing it how? In your tone of voice. Even you walk by, if you see a plant like this, yeah, something physical like this, try to put it together. Begin practicing. When you see any reed broken, you're reminded, I have to be gentle. God is gentle. He wouldn't even break it. So you begin to practice it. It's maturity in your spiritual life. St. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Hmm. And St. Jerome writes about this. Paul wants us to be gentle, approachable people. People that are be approachable. When you're gentle, you can be approached. People who have left anger, bitterness, wrath, and slander behind. If we are merciful and serene, taking the initiative and reaching out to others, our very approachability will overcome the shyness and fear of those who for whom we reach out. When you're shy, sometimes you being gentle, well, you don't have to go to people now. People will come to you. Right? When you're gentle, there are some people that can be very harsh. When you see them, you walk the other way. Right? But there are some people, you see them from afar off, just seeing them, it puts a smile on your face. Because their character, their conduct is very gentle. Very gentle. And they attract people. Attract. You know like the, the, the fly zappers? Of course they're not going to zap you. That's a hard, that's a, you know, maybe not a good analogy. But the way a fly is attracted to light, not the zapper, an actual light bulb, is the way a person with gentleness attracts others. So even if you're shy, and you, but you want to get out of your shyness, be gentle, and people will come to you. People will come to you. It's internal adornment. Sometimes people will, A, worry so much about the outside, but they forget the inside. What does St. Peter write? In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 to 4, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty this is the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet a spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Very precious in the sight of God. This 
gentle spirit. This is the beauty that's within. So work on the inside. Adorn the inside. Sit with yourself. Contemplate. Write down the things that you are weak in. Tell the Lord, Lord, I want to be increasing in these areas. And among them, if I am harsh, if I am rough, gentleness. Make me gentle. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Internal adornment. How do I correct? Sometimes we have to correct others. Yes? Somebody does something wrong. Our children do something wrong. We have to correct. Sunday school kid does something wrong. Uh, we have to correct somehow. Abuna sees something. We have to correct. People look to us to teach what's right. So how do we do this? Hmm. We find in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, you who are spiritual. So in order to correct, you have to be first what? Spiritual. You have to be spiritual. Restore such a one in a spirit of a gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. It is like a surgeon doing surgery. When they open up someone, they're not going in like this. The person's going to die. They're very soft. They're very slow. They're very detail-oriented. They studied it. They, did a, they found the scans, MRI, uh, x-rays, whatever scans they did. They studied the situation. They began to talk with others who are other doctors also. And then they begin to pray, hopefully. There are doctors today in, in society that pray, hopefully they do, right? And then they begin to surgery. Then they can begin to fix. You who are spiritually minded, when you see something wrong, speak with your father of confession. Speak with a spiritual person in your church. I mean khidma, I mean usra. Another parent who is spiritually minded. Take advice from people that are spiritual. Have a plan of how to approach. Pray about it. And then when you approach, very slow in your approach. Very calm in your demeanor. Your tone, your words have been chosen. Like a surgeon chooses his tools for the surgery. You choose your words. What am I going to practice at home in front of a mirror? Imagine if we did that with every type of approach we did before we rebuked someone. We did it as if it was surgery. Because the Lord says, we will be judged by every word, idle, every idle word that comes out of your mouth. We'll be judged. So we are very walking circumspectly, walking a fine line, studying the situation, prayerful. And this is how we restore. Continue. St. Jerome writes, the spirit-led person should correct a sinner gently and meekly. He must not be inflexible, angry, or aggravated. Sometimes we are, when we're angry and aggravated, that's when we want to correct. We hear words like, God forbid. What is this? Where is the spirit of gentleness, humility, love, kindness? Where is this? He must, be not, he must not be inflexible, angry, or aggravated in his desire to correct him. He should stir him up with the promise of salvation. Speak of him, speak to the person that you're going to correct of the good things. Salvation, hope, promising remission and bringing forth the testimony of Christ. How to bring Christ about in all this. This is how we ought to correct. Huh, next. St. John Chrysostom writes this, Anger even ruins the prudent. A soft answer turns away anger, but a painful word arouses rage. All things depend on our decision, certainly also to raise anger or to soothe. It is not the Lord who gets angry, but it is in our power to cause his anger or, to oppo or, or the opposite. 
And if anger even ruins the prudent, how much more will it ruin those about whom it was said that anger destroys the imprudent? And this certainly happens also to the prudent because of some negligence. But a soft answer turns away anger. That is a way of answering in open humility and without any harshness. So without any a harshness. St. Timothy, he, he says how we ought to pursue gentleness. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and a eh, gentleness. Pursue it. It should be a Christian pursuit. So then now we have to pray for this. How do I pray for this? I talked about it a little bit. St. Isaac of Nineveh, or St. Isaac the Syrian, writes, Strive to discover stirrings that are good during the time of prayer, as the wise do. These consist in reflection on the Spirit's insights and sagacious thought and consideration during the time of prayer of how to please the will of the Maker of all. This is what you ought to be praying. How do I deal with your people? How do I... How do I, how do, I do your will? How do I please you in my dealings with people? This is the final end of all virtue and of all prayer, when in these matters you receive the power that stems from grace to be bound firmly to the continual stirrings. You will become a man of God and will cl be close to spiritual things. You, be you become close to a spiritual things. This is how we ought to do in our prayers. This is the last point. Empathy. Have empathy. You Empathy. Saint Jerome writes this. It is reasonable to ask why one should instruct a sinner in a spirit of gentleness. Why should you tell somebody to be corrected in a spirit of gentleness? It is good to reflect that one might themselves be tempted. So you think of yourself, man, I could be tempted too. I could be in the same position that the person is in. Would the righteous person who is certain of his own resolve and confident that he cannot fall, therefore have no duty to instruct a sinner in the spirit of gentleness, if you, being a Christian, are not falling into this? Or if you have the humility that you can fall into this, should you also not instruct others as you would like to be instructed if had you fallen into it? To this we reply that even if the righteous one has prevailed, knowing with what difficulty he prevailed over his own temptations, he should rather be ready to extend pardon to the sinner. So if you have overcome the sin of the tongue, lust, the love of money, do you remember how you overcame these things? Do you remember how hard you worked? Then you should also give to others and give excuses to others who are falling in them. You should give excuse to others and this builds up a gentleness to others. Overcoming not Overcoming or not overcoming is sometimes in our own power, but being tempted is in the power of the tempter. The Savior himself was tempted, so who of us can be sure that he might cross this, this sea of life without any temptation? The Lord himself was tempted on the mount. How can you be sure that you're not going to be tempted in this way also, that you see the other person? So empathize, feel for others. So we find, this is the review, that gentleness is the fruit of the Spirit, we ought to be gentle in our speech and manner of speech. Not just the words, but the way we say the words. It should be persuasion, as we find it even in the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman. First, she said he's a, a Jew, then a prophet, and then she said, could this be the Christ? Three levels. Verse 9, 19, and 29. Very easy to remember of what she said about the Lord Jesus Christ. A Jew, a prophet, and then the Christ. Could this be the Christ? Persuasion, and discussion, and not anger. It comes from God. It is founded on humility. It is bearing with one another. It is knowing our limits. It is maturity and spirituality. It is known to all men. It is internal endowment. It is correct without being harsh, but gentle. Gentleness is softness in conduct and answers. It is Christian pursuit for the man of God. It is attained by prayer and empathy with others. If you want to be gentle, follow these 14 points. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you about it right now and test you. Another time, maybe. 
But if you want to be gentle, do these things. And be reminded of the heavenly reward of how we are with each other. When the Lord asks us, come, when He says to us, we ought to hear the voice full of joy saying, Come to me, you blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for you from the foundation of eh, the world. What foundation? Your gentleness with people. Your love towards people. The humility that you had. The things that you have founded on, on humility, gentleness. And glory be to God forever. Amen.